right, once again, so, so very, very quiet. Hey, uh, kids, you guys are dismissed. Elementary kids, youth group, you guys are also dismissed uh, to class. If you're visiting today and you have your kids with you, they're welcome to go out or stay in, or you can go out with them and check out the children's ministry and make sure they're comfortable. Um, everybody else, uh, so good to have you. Uh, I'm super excited for today. I hope that you're gonna stay afterward with us and just hang out out on the patio and uh, where else can you get lunch for nothing, right? So you might as well stay and get some good fellowship. And uh, um, so turn to Revelation chapter four. And if you're just, again, just joining us, we're studying right through the book of Revelation. We've uh, looked at chapter one, chapters two and three. Now we're moving right on from the letters to the churches, right on into the rest of the book. And uh, it's all, well, after this morning, it's all downhill from here. So uh, anyway, we're going to enjoy our time this morning in chapter four. But before we do, let's pray and just really ask the Lord to bless uh, his word. Father, we do thank you so much for this chance to be together, Lord. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the privilege of being able to study it together, Lord. And we pray that you would be our teacher even now this morning, that the teaching ministry of your spirit would be manifest here amongst us today, Lord. We pray as we pray every single time we open your word. Lord, that you would give us ears to hear what your spirit is speaking to your church, Lord. Um, give us ears to hear individually. Lord, give us ears to hear collectively. Uh, and we thank you, Lord. And we ask your blessing on this time in Jesus' name. Amen. So Revelation chapter 4. And we remember in chapter 1, in verse 19, remember that Jesus told John, he said, to write the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. And so Jesus gives us then this divinely inspired outline of the book itself. And remember, in chapter 1, we looked at the things which you, or the things which John was seeing. It was the revelation of the glorified Christ, right? The Lord's person. And then we've spent quite a few weeks looking at chapters two and three at the things which are. The things which are both in John's day as well as the things which are in our day. Chapters two and three, we look at the church. And we talked about the ways that we see kind of the, an entire scope of church history contained in those two chapters. And so chapters two and three, we could call the Lord's people. So we've got the Lord's person, we have the Lord's people, and as we move this morning into chapter 4, we're going to begin that third section of the book. It's looking at the things which will take place after this. Chapters 4 through 22, the end of the book, uh, all deal with the things which are yet to come. It's the Lord's program, if you will, for the future. And we're going to see Jesus unfold for John some very specific details of the future, including all of those events that lead up to the second coming of Christ, the second coming of Christ itself in chapter 19, and then the aftermath and the millennial kingdom, chapter 20, and then the new Jerusalem, the new heaven, the new earth, chapters 21 through the end of the book in chapter 22. And from Revelation chapter 4 up through 19, we have this section which primarily focuses on God's judgment upon the world before the earthly return and the reign of Jesus. It's that seven-year period known as the tribulation. And we're going to see God's judgments are announced first by seven sealed scroll and then by seven trumpets and then seven bowls that will be pouring out God's wrath upon the earth. And this morning, Revelation chapter 4 kind of introduces us to the place from which all of these judgments are going to come, and that's the throne of God in heaven. And it's a wonderful chapter. It provides certainly this wonderful picture of this heavenly scene, and it provides this wonderful view from that vantage point. Because with John, we are about to get a complete shift in our perspective. Because now we're gonna start to look at things on the earth as they occur, but now we're gonna have a view from heaven. 
First, we're going to get a look at heaven, and then we're going to get a view from heaven. And it all starts here in verse 1 with this call from the throne. Look at verse 1 of Revelation chapter 4. It says, After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. So it starts out, after these things. Well, after what things? Well, after the things of chapters 2 and 3. Chapters 2 and 3 spoke to the churches. Remember, those seven churches were representative of all the churches in all of church history. So after Jesus is finished speaking to the churches, John now experiences this call from heaven to come up to heaven and he says he's going to go there through a door standing open in heaven. And right away, of course, we see in this very first verse such a vivid picture of what we call the rapture of the church. John is called up to heaven by a voice that sounds like a trumpet, just in the very same way that Paul describes the church will be. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul writes that the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. You remember in his messages to the last four of the seven churches, Jesus spoke of his imminent return. And remember, he warned them that unless they really repented, that they would be cast into the tribulation. But then remember that that promise, that if they kept his word, right, if they were some of the overcomers, if they kept his word, then he would keep them from the hour of trial. And his means of doing that is this rapture of the church. Now, rapture, the word is not in the Bible. Rapture simply means catching away. As the church is caught up into heaven, just the way that Paul described. And so here in verse 1 of Revelation chapter 4, we have this picture of the believing church transported into heaven before we start to see any of the judgments of that seven year period of tribulation on the earth. And as that judgment unfolds, we're going to see with John, right, a representative of the church, we're going to see all that occur from heaven. What's interesting is that in the first three chapters that we've looked at so far, the word church appeared 19 different times. You know, write to the church of this and write to the church of that and tell the church this. Now from chapter 4, on through the entire rest of the book, the word church never appears again. Why? Because in chapter 4, the church is taken out of the scene and up into heaven. And now John's going to see the things that must take place after this, after the church is gone. And I think that the language there is important because the things that Jesus is going to show John in the following chapters... They belong to the future. But not only, I think, does it point to the future, but it's important that we see it points to the sovereign purposes of God. All of these spectacular, almost unbelievable things that we are about to see, they are guaranteed to occur because they are all a part of the working out of God's plan for this planet. They must take place. They must take place as God rules from his throne, which now John is about to get a glimpse of. Look in verse 2. We start to see this description of the glory of the throne. It says in verse 2, Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. So the very first thing that strikes John, right? He's in heaven. And the very first thing that catches his attention and now will be his primary focus from this point forward is the throne. And it's not an empty throne. There is someone who sits on 
this heavenly throne. And right there, it's such a powerful declaration, not just of God's presence on the throne, but of his sovereign, rightful reign. It's a, a powerful declaration of his prerogative to rule from that throne. He sits sovereignly there, up in the heavens, and there's no apology for it. There's no rebellion against it. Notice there are no committees or cabinets, no Congress, no parliament, no opinion polls, no political parties, none of that kind of stuff, just God there on his throne. And that might sound like a point I don't need to make, and yet just this fact absolutely shapes our very worldview because the bottom line of atheism or the bottom line of materialism is that there is no throne, right? There's no seat of central authority or power that the universe has to be responsible to. Now, the bottom line of humanism is that there is a throne, but we sit upon it, right? Man sits upon that throne. Woman sits upon that throne. Essentially, people can't live without the concept of a throne, right? Somebody has to be in charge. And what happens if people dethrone God, then inescapably what we're forced to do is put either ourselves or put someone else up on that throne. Very often in history, it's proven out to be a political leader. We look at what happened with Lenin and Stalin and Mao. More recently, maybe it's just an ideology. Maybe it's the government itself. Maybe it's a system of government. But simply, we can't think rightly about anything until we can settle it in our minds that there is an occupied throne in heaven and that it's the God of the Bible who rules from that throne. It says in the Psalms, the Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. I love the way the one author put it. He says, while there may be many differing interpretations, the fundamental truths are self-evident. At the center of everything is an occupied throne. And so the book of Revelation, just like the rest of the scriptures, teach us that it's the throne of God. It's not ultimately the thrones of man that rule the universe. And this is this truth which has been so especially encouraging to believers all throughout history, especially those who've been under severe persecution or, or, or facing some kind of uncertainty. And you might remember, if you were with us back when we looked at chapter 1, we see that a very similar vision Isaiah was given in chapter 6 of his prophecy. And you remember that's the vision where Isaiah declared that in the year of King Uzziah, the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Then he says that the angels cried, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, and the whole earth is full of his glory. And you remember that King Uzziah was one of the greatest kings that Israel ever had. He ruled over like 50 years, right? 50 good, wonderful years over the nation, and he had just died leaving everyone to sort of wonder what is going to happen to Judah now. And so it's at this time where everybody is starting to kind of question a little bit. Maybe even Isaiah was starting to get a little bit worried. But it's at this time that the Lord gives Isaiah this revelation of this throne, the throne that's behind all of the other thrones. He gives Isaiah this revelation, this vision of the throne that is never empty because it's the throne that God sits on. And so John now sees that very same throne, sees that God is on that throne that's behind all of the other thrones of the world. And that is such an encouraging truth for us to be reminded, no matter what it is that we are facing, that God sits sovereignly on his throne ruling and reigning over the universe, even when things don't make sense, right? When our lives, right, or when our country, when our world seems to be out of control, when we seem to think that God is absent. And I, I know that I'm belaboring this point, but I'm belaboring it for a purpose. And that's because I think that this is something that we always need to be sure to remember before 
we turn on the news. Before we start to scroll through our feed, before we pick up the paper, if anybody is still actually picking up the paper, right? We need to remember, right, that so often what we're seeing at best is the throne of Uzziah, but maybe a, a people a lot less fit than Uzziah. We're maybe looking at the thrones of Ahab, right, or the thrones of Manasseh, right, whoever it is. But the reality is that there is a righteous throne behind these thrones that we can see, right? A throne in heaven that's never ending and that never changes. And that God, notice there it says that God is seated upon that throne. If you're underlining stuff, underline or circle that word seated, right? God's not pacing. God is not anxious about anything at all. But he's the picture of peace upon that throne. And I think that, that if what that tells us is that if he can relax, then we can relax. Amen? If the picture here was of God, like sometimes you see in the movie, the king pacing back and forth in the throne room, we might have something to be a little bit concerned about, right? But that's not at all what it says at all. Heaven is completely relaxed. They are not alarmed at all about what they see happening down here. They don't like it one bit, but they're not alarmed about it. They're not alarmed as they look at what's happening in the world. They're not even alarmed as they look at the things that are happening in our individual lives because heaven knows that God ultimately always wins. They know that God has the final say in every situation in all history. He sits there upon that throne. And everything that that means to us, everything that that means for us. And the next thing we see now is John trying to describe what it is that he actually saw. Look at verse 3. It says, And he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. So as John tries to describe this occupant of the throne, notice he doesn't describe a distinct figure. He just tries to get a handle on this glory and the majesty. And he could only compare it, right? He says it's like the beautiful radiance of these precious stones. It's like these emanations of glistening light he says in two particular colors now there's no picture that could do this justice and yet here's kind of an artist's representation that might help us a little bit jasper is a clear stone uh, ultimately in, the, in its purest form it's like a diamond and it speaks of god's purity it also speaks of light because as john tells us in his letter god is light and in him there's no darkness at all. Now, sardius is red. It's like a ruby kind of a red. And it speaks of, I think, redemption. It speaks to us of the blood of Christ, which flowed from him at Calvary. In Romans chapter 5, Paul talks about how we've been justified by his blood. And what I think is so interesting here is if you put these two stones together, they so beautifully communicate what it is that God does in each and every human life that he touches. You start with that jasper, right? The first stone that we mentioned. He just comes into our life as a light. And he takes that white, hot light of his holiness, and then he lays it alongside our life, doesn't he? And he exposes our sin to us. Only God can bring light to the darkness of the sin you know, the, the dark places of our lives and the, the dark places of the relationships or those dark places that we know are in each of our hearts. And God exposes that with his light. But then, you know, just when that bright exposure of our sin leaves us kind of without hope that there's any possible way we could be saved out of that situation, what happens? He comes in immediately. He hides completely what that light exposes he hides that then with his blood he hides it with that red stone of the sardius stone and he provides redemption for us and he provides it because of his mercy and his grace 
and his love. And then all around the throne, right, mixing with all of these two colors, this brilliant white, this ruby red, what does it say? We have this beautiful emerald colored rainbow, which I think in and of itself is another great encouragement because it's a beautiful reminder of God's commitment to his covenant with us. Because a rainbow in the scriptures takes us back where? It takes us back to Genesis chapter 9, when God made his lasting covenant with mankind not to destroy the world again with water. And the sign of that covenant was this bow that he set in the sky after the storm. And so a rainbow speaks of God's promise. It speaks of his covenant of mercy. And even though this throne of God is about to send forth, forth this awful judgment upon all of mankind, here I think in this rainbow we are reminded that even in his wrath, God will still remember mercy. I just think that it's amazing all around this setting of sovereignty and of power and of authority and of glory, all around this setting of the throne of God, God has placed this reminder of his own promise that in effect, it directs and it even limits his own sovereignty. Because a throne says what? A throne says, I can do whatever I want because I'm the king. But a promise says, I'm going to fulfill my word to you and I cannot do otherwise. And so I think that the mention of this rainbow around the throne is such a remarkable thing. Of course, Spurgeon said it better than any of us could. He said, oh, child of God, the heavenly father in his sovereignty has a right to do with you his child as he pleases, but he will never let that sovereignty get out of the limit of the covenant. As a sovereign, he might cast you away, but he has promised that he never will, and never will he. As a sovereign, he might leave you to perish, but he has said, I will not leave thee nor forsake thee. As a sovereign, he might suffer you to be tempted beyond your strength, but he has promised that no temptation shall happen to you, but such as is common to man, and he will with that temptation make a way of escape. And we need to hold on to this kind of truth. We need to hold on to it as we encounter struggles and as we endure hardship, especially when we don't understand. Because remember, I think it's interesting, Noah saw only the ark of the rainbow, but John here, notice that he sees the complete rainbow all around the throne. And I think that this is significant because it's another reminder to us that what we see of God's mercy is incomplete at best today, just in the same way that it was incomplete for Noah. It's like when Paul wrote that now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face, and now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. And there are so many people, even Christians, who really question God's judgments. They question his mercies and they question his methods, especially as we watch wickedness continue as it is in the world. But remember, we're only seeing half the picture. We're only seeing half the promise. And all we can do for now is simply trust that when we finally do get to heaven, that we're going to see the whole pattern. We're going to see the complete picture. We're going to see the entire rainbow encircling the throne. And until then, we can rest safely and we can rely fully both on God's sovereignty and on that promise that he made, that covenant that he made of mercy. His glory and his grace and his mercy, they are absolutely unsearchable. They are beyond our comprehension. And yet, when we do finally get to that place where we can comprehend it, we will spend eternity praising him for it. Because the very next thing we see as we move from this first image of beholding the glory of the one on the throne, now we're going to start to look at those who are there around the throne. 
Look at verse 4. It starts to talk about the elders around the throne. It says, around the throne were 24 thrones. And on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. Now, there have been lots of ideas about the identity of these 24 elders, and commentators and teachers will debate whether they are glorified human beings or angelic beings. On balance, they certainly seem to represent God's people. Here they are robed in, in the white righteousness of Christ. They're sitting enthroned with him. They're, they're crowned with these crowns of service. In, in the Bible, the number 24 is very often understood as the number of representation. For example, in the law of Moses, there were 24 orders of the priesthood, and those 24 orders then represented all of the people before God. You have the 12 tribes of Israel. You have the 12 apostles who represent all of the faithful of man. So the 24 elders likely represent the whole of the Lord's people throughout history. The whole of redeemed humankind. In the next chapter, in chapter 5, we're going to see as these very same 24 elders sing a song of praise to Jesus that only we as humans could sing. They sing that you were slain, you have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. So in that passage, they clearly demonstrate that they're human beings because we're the only ones that could sing that song. Angels can't sing that song because angels were not redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. So it's safest to simply see them as representative of all of the, the saved people of God throughout time. And here we see them sitting on thrones of their own, right, surrounding this great throne. What a remarkable thought to think that for all of eternity that redeemed, glorified people will sit enthroned with Jesus. Lesser thrones, to be sure, Right? But we're going to be there with thrones. Right? Paul says that we're joint heirs with Christ. He says that we're going to reign with him. And before you get all caught up thinking about your throne, right, or thinking about how cool your crown is going to be or how great it's going to look, here's something significant I don't want us to miss in this picture. Notice that the church is represented here by these elders as being in a very specific place. They're around the throne. Because there's nowhere else where we can be but gathered around his throne of grace to be blessed the way that he wants to bless us. It's great when we gather at a restaurant or when we gather at a movie or when we gather at coffee. But to be gathered together around the throne of God, then we start to understand the intimate fellowship that he wants to have with us. And if we haven't been there recently, right, if we're not going there daily, we need to make sure that we make time to spend time with him. Because every minute we spend there with him now is going to be good practice for eternity. We may even want to start working on the words to some of these songs that we're going to be singing so we don't look like idiots when we get up there. As we gather around the throne, that's the time when we start to see amazing things and we're reminded of a very important attribute of God. Look at what it says in verse 5. It says that from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. There is a real sense of awe and a reverent fear that needs to be associated with the throne of God. And I think that we're reminded here in verse 5 of something that Christians sometimes maybe even strategically forget, and that's that this throne is not only a throne of grace, but it's a throne of, it's a throne of raw power. And it needs to produce in us this healthy sense of awe and of reverence 
I tell you, one of the most awe-inspiring things that can happen, I think, in a human life is to sit through a thunder and lightning storm. Of course, we don't get too many of them out here, and when we get them, they burn down half of the mountain, right? But I remember years ago, our family was caught in the middle of one of these storms, and we were out in the middle of the wide open plains of Wyoming visiting family. And it was like nothing we had ever witnessed before. So much so, we all got out lawn chairs, right? And we sat on the lawn watching this thunderstorm, which in hindsight may not have been the best idea, right? And yet we're from California, so we're not very smart, of course, but there we were in our lawn chairs. But just, to, just the sheer power of it and just the sheer volume of it it gives you that in the middle of something that is just way beyond our finiteness. And I think that a thunder and lightning storm, if you've ever experienced it like that, I think that that just begins to express the kind of power that God has. And so this fear-inspiring lightning and thunder and voices and the fire that we see here in the presence of God in heaven, isn't it reminiscent exactly of God's fearful presence when he appeared to his people at Mount Sinai, right? Thunder, lightning, those are signs that there's a storm a-coming, right? And you remember in Exodus chapter 19, God thundered at Sinai when he gave the law, and he is going to thunder again to judge those who've broken that law. In Psalm 77, it says, the voice of your thunder was in the whirlwind and the lightnings lit up the world. The earth trembled and shook. Church, there is a storm that's gathering in heaven. And these thunderings and these lightnings that are pictured for us here in chapter four, at the point that we're called up into heaven, they are the beginnings of the storm that we are going to see break forth in chapters 8 and then chapter 11 and then in chapter 16 as the thunders and the lightnings now come hit the earth during that future time as God pours out his wrath upon an unbelieving world. And this thunders and lightnings as he pours out his wrath, here's just a preview of what we're going to see. If they're going to result in war and widespread death, famine, the most violent earthquake ever known, great disturbances in the heavens, a third of the earth's vegetation destroyed, a third of the earth's ocean life destroyed, a third of the earth's freshwater fish destroyed, a third of the sun, the moon, and the stars darkened, a hellish invasion of the earth by demons who are going to torment the inhabitants of the earth, hailstorms that are going to destroy a third of the earth's trees and green grass, greater hailstorms with hailstones that weigh 125 pounds each. Then there's a plague of terrible sores that are going to come upon human beings. Then there's the total poisoning of all of the earth's fresh water. And then there's the total poisoning, finally, of all of the earth's salt water. So you got that to look forward to. What's that is right. That's what I, what's that? Now I know that for many, this kind of thing can seem shocking, right? It seems kind of hard to swallow. And yet, notice I think that in this verse we see that God's heart is that no one should have to face any of that. Because look what we see there in verse 5, is that with these signs of impending danger, with the thunderings and with the lightnings, there are also warnings of that coming judgment through these voices. There are warnings to man to seek after God and to heed the voices of his messengers. And what do we see all throughout the Old Testament? We see God warning the pagan people. We see God warning his own people by sending prophets. And we see him even today warning the wicked world using the voices of who? Of us. Using the voices of us as believers. Right? Paul says, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? God has chosen to use us 
as the voices to warn those who are in disobedience. And I know, right, that can sometimes seem like a very overwhelming, kind of an awesome responsibility, but look how encouraging it is. Look, look what is immediately connected in this very same verse with these voices, connected with the warning messages. What's the next thing we see? There are the seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Another beautiful reference to the full fold, seven fold working of the Holy Spirit. Remember, remember what Jesus said in John chapter 16. He said that when the Spirit has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And one of the most primary ministries of the Holy Spirit is to go out before us and to bring conviction to the hearts of people and to prepare them to respond as we share the gospel of Christ with them. And we need to remember that that is his job. And we need to then allow him to do his job while we do our job, which is simply to pray for and to make ourselves available to these divine appointments that the Spirit provides us and the people that he sets into our paths who've been prepared to hear that message of hope from our lips. God has sent his spirit into the world. He's provided these voices to warn of future judgment and yet to a world that doesn't heed the warning, judgment is sure. As we move on now, we've looked at this awesome picture of this heavenly throne room, right? There's the one on the throne. There's these elders around the throne. And the next thing we see, I think, is another, another especially intriguing element in this whole heavenly scene. In verses six and seven, we get a look at these creatures that are amidst the throne. It says that before the throne, there was a sea of glass like crystal. And in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second living creature like a calf. The third living creature had a face like a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. What in the world are these things? It's like something out of that bar scene in Star Wars, right? Kind of. The first Star Wars, if anybody's that old. So when we compare this with other texts, it seems like these four living creatures are a pretty interesting combination of the seraphim that we see in Isaiah 6 and the cherubim that we see in Ezekiel 1 and Ezekiel 10. And the, the one, they're sort of unique to this passage, but the one thing that's clear is that these are some spectacular angelic beings. They're the guardians of, and they, they sit there surrounding the throne. Ezekiel chapter 28 seems to indicate that Satan was once one of this kind of high angelic being. And throughout church history, there has been no shortage of interpretations to what these amazing four-faced creatures might represent. Here's a few. The elements, right, or the cardinal virtues, or the faculties and the powers of the human soul. Maybe they represent the patriarchal churches and the great apostles, or the orders of churchmen, or the principal angels, or the four symbols of Jesus as represented in the Gospels. Right? Matthew, you have the lion of the tribe of Judah. Mark, like the ox, right? the servant of all. Luke, the son of man. Right? Or John, like you know, an eagle that, that flies, soars in the heavenlies because Jesus come down from heaven. So those are all potential solutions for this. Now, in context, I think that I like best the thought that's been proposed by a number of accomplished students of the Bible is that these four living creatures would appear to stand for everything that is noblest and strongest and wisest and swiftest throughout the realm of creation. Because each of these things has preeminence in their own particular group. So the lion is supreme amongst wild animals. The ox is supreme amongst domesticated animals. The eagle is supreme among birds. And of course, man is supreme amongst all creatures. So I believe that these four living creatures 
represent all of the greatness and the strength and the beauty of the creation in its entirety. And as intriguing, I think, as the description of these four faces, the thing that really strikes me is this detail that John specifically points out about their many eyes. Because eyes in the scriptures represent insight or awareness or understanding and intelligence. And this multitude of eyes that they have, right? They're covered with eyes, it says, on the front and on the back. And it shows us very clearly that these living creatures aren't some sort of blind instruments, right? They're not programmed robots there around the throne, but they know and they understand and they have greater insight. They have greater perception than any man could possibly have. They see everything, right? They're aware of everything that's going on all around them there in that heavenly scene. And I believe that it's precisely because of these things. It's precisely because they are beings of intelligence and understanding that what we're going to see next is that they live their entire existence for one reason, and that's simply to worship God. Because in the next we see that their very purpose Look in verse 8, it's the worship of him on the throne. It says that the four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes all around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. So as these creatures are representative for us of all of creation, here we see the creation praising its creator, right? The triune, Elohim, Yahweh, right? Psalm 19 says, the heavens declare the glory of God. Jesus himself, as he came into Jerusalem, said, I tell you, if these should keep silent, speaking of the people, what did he say? That these stones would immediately cry out. And what Paul tells us is that the creation itself is God's primary source of revealing himself to man. It says that since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So there's a sense in which the creation itself recognizes and gives praise to its creator. What I think is especially interesting is that in Genesis chapter 9, God had made his covenant specifically with mankind, with birds, with cattle, and with wild beasts. And so here, each of them represented by a different face on these creatures and all of them giving praise to him. And yet here's the great irony. Did you ever consider how strange it is that it's only God's greatest creation, humankind, who so often doesn't recognize his authority? The animals do. The seas obey him. It's man that was Adam's mistake, and it's the mistake of every one of us since. But we make this mistake because we lack understanding. We make this mistake because we lack insight and we lack the, that same awareness that these four living creatures had. We lack the awareness that came from all of their many eyes, right, that see everything. Because when you think about it, all of our failure to truly worship God is rooted in a lack of really seeing and really understanding him for who he is. If we really see and understand God for who he is and for what he does, we cannot help but to worship him. Because it says right there, he is the Lord God Almighty. And remember back in chapter 1, we talked about that word carries the idea of the one who has his hand on everything. And folks, let me encourage you and remind you again, he does. No matter what it is that you are facing, 
no matter what you're dealing with in your life, God has his hand on everything. And so I think here we have these four creatures, right, symbolizing the creation. They're before the throne. They are reminding us that God is in control of all creation and that he will keep his promise to one day deliver the creation from the bondage of our sin. And this whole chapter, I think, is put right here under the inspiration of the Spirit as a reminder. It's just prior to all of these catastrophic judgments that we are about to see. Here is a reminder, first of all, that God is in control, a reminder that he is to be praised, and a reminder that everything he does is holy because he himself is holy. So much so that here these creatures are constantly repeating this phrase, holy, holy, holy. Notice it says they do not rest day or night to just continue to declare God's holy character. Now, I'll be the first one to tell you I don't speak Hebrew, okay? And yet, according to those who study these things, I thought this was super interesting it says that in Hebrew, the double repetition of a word adds emphasis, while the very rare threefold repetition designates the superlative. It's like good, better, best, right? And it calls attention to the infinite holiness of God. So what these four living creatures in heaven is they offer this uninterrupted praise to God for one specific trait, and that's his holiness. Isn't that amazing? It's not for his grace. It's not for his mercy. And oh, how we love his grace, and oh, how we love his mercy, don't we? But when you go through the Bible, from Genesis all the way to the end of Revelation, the single characteristic that God is praised most for, from one end all the way to the other, you guessed it, what is it? It's his holiness. Now, don't misdefine holiness. Holiness isn't having some certain kind of look or dressing in a certain way. Or it, it, Most simply, holy just means to be separate. It's to be different. It's to be set apart from. Jesus is the perfect picture, isn't he, of holiness. Because Jesus was different than everyone and everything that was around him. He was set apart to the Father. And heaven is completely different from the earth. The economy of heaven is completely different than the earth. And the whole idea of God's holiness, I think, makes earth uneasy because it seems so lofty and so threatening and it seems so alien and foreign to us. And yet, God calls us as his people into his holiness so that we can be in fellowship with him. In Leviticus, he told them, you must be holy because I, the Lord, your God, am holy. And I am so convinced that we all desperately need this kind of consistent and constant reminder of God's holiness and of the importance of it. And that so much of our weak, meager Christian existence comes as a direct result of the fact that we have lost, or maybe like the church of Ephesus, maybe we've just left that understanding of the holiness of our God. I know some of you are familiar probably with the book, The Knowledge of the Holy by A.W. Tozer. And if you're not familiar with it, let me encourage you to become familiar with it. Right? It was named one of the most 50 most you know, uh, books that has most shaped Christianity. Tozer was an American Christian and a pastor and an author. And he had these amazing insights, I think, on the spiritual condition, not only of God's people collectively, but certainly of each of us as Christians individually. And in this book, he says this, and it's a long quote, so relax, stretch out, seventh inning stretch. He says, I refer to the loss of the concept of majesty from popular religious mind. The church has surrendered her once lofty concept of God and has substituted for it 
one so low, so ignoble as to be utterly unworthy of thinking, worshiping men. This she has done, not deliberately, but little by little and without her knowledge, and her very unawareness only makes her situation all the more tragic. The low view of God entertained almost universally among Christians is the cause of a hundred lesser evils everywhere among us. A whole new philosophy of the Christian life has resulted from this one basic error in our religious thinking. With our loss of the sense of the majesty has come the loss of religious awe and consciousness of the divine presence. We've lost our spirit of worship and our ability to withdraw inwardly to meet God in adoring silence. Modern Christianity is simply not producing the kind of Christian who can appreciate or experience life in the spirit. The words, be still and know that I am God, mean next to nothing to the self-confident, bustling worshiper in this middle period of the 20th century. Now that was written in 1961, nearly 60 years ago. And certainly we all know where we are even more so. But just try to imagine how a better understanding of God's holiness would so radically change the way that we live our lives how it would radically change the things we do and even the things that we think. And I, I believe that our reaction personally, if we truly understood, would be just like we see with those 24 elders here. Watch how they respond in our last few verses. Watch how they respond to this praise and the worship that's offered to God by the living creatures. Not only does creation cry out in praise, but verse 9 says that whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by you, oh, sorry, and by your will, they exist and were created. What a beautiful picture, right? These 24 elders representing all of the redeemed of mankind, they join in with this worship, acknowledging that he's the creator, acknowledging that he's the sustainer, giving God alone credit for their own rewards. And then it says that we cast our crowns down before him. Now, there was a practice at that time in the Roman Empire. You know, the emperor of Rome ruled over many lesser kings because when they would go in and conquer a kingdom, they wouldn't necessarily kill off the king or even dispense with the king, but they would often allow the king to rule, but under the authority of Rome, under the overall authority of the emperor of Rome. And these kings were at times commanded to come in before the emperor and to lay their crowns before him and pay homage to him. And then he would pick up those crowns and give them back to the king. And it was a demonstration that their crowns and the very right that they had to rule, that their victory came from him. And what a beautiful picture here as we watch the worship by these elders, right? They recognize what we need to recognize, that all worth, right, all worthiness belongs to God and not to us, right? He alone has the glory and the honor and the power. He alone should get the crown. Now, again, quickly, these crowns, those are those Stephanos crowns that we've talked about. It's the kind of crowns that were given as rewards to, like, Olympic athletes, in the scriptures, we see that there's crowns for righteousness and life and glory and the crowns of a soul winner and the crowns of a martyr. These are the crowns that we're going to receive based on the things that we do for him in this, in this life. And so here we're to throw, right? We will throw every achievement and reward, even our own right to govern ourselves. We're going to throw those things back to God because we know that he alone is worthy. 
This picture is like our confession to God that everything that we are and everything that we do here for him on earth, we do because he gave us the grace and the power to do it. And so now we offer even the reward he's given us right back to him. When we finally get to heaven, folks, we are going to finally realize in an awesome new way, just like these elders are showing us, we're going to realize that all praise and all honor and all glory goes to him. And we will be on our knees before him. And so the question, of course, for us is, what is keeping us from realizing that even now? Seeing here that the elders and the creatures, right, seeing that they are worshiping God, it should prompt us to worship God in that very same way here and now. Because we have no, we have nothing less to praise him for than they do. Again, Spurgeon said it so well. He said, do we sing as much as the birds do? Yet what, do, uh, yet what have birds to sing about compared with us? Do we sing as much as the angels do, and yet they were never redeemed by the blood of Christ? Birds of the air shall you excel me, angels shall you exceed me. You have done so, but I intend to emulate you, and day by day, night by night, pour forth my soul in sacred song. What a powerful picture, right? And notice all of creation, all of mankind praising God because, look what it says there in verse 11, it's by his will that we exist and we're created. Now some of your translations may render it, and I like it even better, that we were created for his pleasure. And I think this is so important because it reminds us of something that most people have forgotten or maybe something that they didn't knew, ever knew is that we were created for God's pleasure, not for our own. Our primary purpose in life is to seek to please God, not ourselves. And you know as well as I do, people do not like to be told this. They don't like to admit this because it gets in the way of all of those self-focused, self-centered ideas that we talked about last week, and we end up just like the lukewarm Laodiceans. But we see how this whole mentality, right, the whole current culture is just a lie of the enemy that's designed to keep us in bondage as we're trying to be free in the worship of self, and it just brings us even more under the control of the enemy. But what we need to understand is that it's only when we look to please God and deny self, that's the only time we're going to find true happiness because it's only then that we will finally be fulfilling God's ultimate purpose for our lives. We were created to bring pleasure to him. And that's only when I accept that about why I've been created. It's only when I then engage in that very thing that I was created for, then I find fulfillment in life. But until I'm engaged really engaged in that relationship with the Lord until I'm engaged in the worship of him as my creator, there will always be this nagging sense in my life that there must be something more to life than I'm experiencing. And the reason that we feel that is because until we're fully engaged in that relationship, then yes, there is something that's missing in our life. There is more to life than we're experiencing. And so really just to accept this truth about God and to accept this truth about why we're created, that's to be able to then head into life as God really intended it to be. To live lives that are set apart to worship him and that are yielded to his will and these lives that have a knowledge of the holy. And finally notice, this is the last point I promised before taquitos, well, first communion, then taquitos. Notice that the worship of the 24 elders is prompted by the living creatures. And since the living creatures, it says, worship God day and night, that means the elders in heaven are worshiping God day and night. 
just as we should be doing here. Everything we do should be an act of worship. Every day we live, we should live with and we should live in this understanding of God's holiness. I love that expression that work well done rises like a hymn of praise to God. So whatever situation we find ourselves placed in, there is an opportunity in that situation for true worship. Whether it's in our homes or at school or work or within specific relationships or whether it's ministry within the body of Christ, maybe it's just within the quietness of our own souls, we simply need to do those things that please him and then do those things as an act of worship to him. The highest form of worship is what? It's obedience. It's obedience to his word and it's obedience to his will. And so I want us to remember this chapter, right? I want us to remember these elders because they represent all of us, right? This worship, the crowns, the robes, and the heart of these 24 elders, that should be our heart as well. I'm going to close this morning with one more shorter quote from Tozer. He says, the only way to recoup our spiritual losses is to go back to the cause of them and make such corrections as truth warrants. The decline of the knowledge of the holy has brought on our troubles. A rediscovery of the majesty of God will go a long way toward curing them. It is impossible to keep our moral practices sound and our inward attitudes right while our idea of God is erroneous or inadequate. If we would bring back spiritual power to our lives, we must begin to think of God more nearly as he is. Amen. We're going to close this morning as we close in worship by celebrating communion. And what an opportunity just to consider God's holiness and to consider the way that we relate to it than to do that as we give thanks for the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. We don't have membership here at Calvary Chapel, so you don't need to be a member of this church to take communion with us this morning. You do need to be a believer in Jesus Christ to take communion. That's the only requirement. And if you're not yet a believer in Jesus Christ, we can fix that this morning. There'll be some people up front perhaps that you could come and you could pray with if that's a step that you want to take, if you want to be forgiven and start in on a new life and a new walk forgiven of your sins by Jesus. We can, uh, we can help you with that this morning. But for everyone else, as the team just begins to minister, hopefully you all have a, a little cup that you picked up on your way in. If you don't, just raise your hands and we'll get one brought over to you. I think one over here, one in the back, one over there. So um, the men will come around with the trays and if you need one, grab one um, and take communion as you feel led uh, on your own. Pastor Jeff is over here. If anyone needs prayer, and I think I see Anne's coming over here, if anyone else needs prayer. Um, so let's just have a, a time. I think we've got a song and a half or two songs or so. And then I'll come up and I'll dismiss us. So, Father, we thank you so much for this morning, Lord. And we thank you for um, just this reminder, Lord, of how it is that we should relate to you, Lord. We thank you so much for the intimacy that we share, Lord. But we also thank you for this reminder of the fact that you are set apart from us, Lord. You're set apart from your creation, Lord. You're so much bigger than uh, anything we can even imagine. And so we pray that you would um, just make that truth uh, real to our hearts this morning, Lord. Uh, it's your greatness, it's your, your bigness, Lord, that allows us to be able to entrust ourselves to you, Lord. And so we pray you'd make that fresh and real to us today. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name.